Okay, we're going to talk about the herbicide in this lecture, and this is an added tool uh, for, to Aldo's toolbox, and it's mainly because when he articulated the tools of wildlife management, herbicides were not yet available uh, to use, so he did not include them. But they are certainly very important, and uh, they do have some real application where they are uh, our best option to manage or uh, particularly for wildlife restoration purposes uh, to restore plant communities and we'll talk about why. So the intended outcomes uh, are pretty general. Uh, you could control, suppress, uh, or defoliate plant communities. One of the things that we can do with herbicides because we have specific formulations, we can use selectivity to target specific unwanted weeds and leave everything else uh, undamaged. So selectivity is, uh, you'll, you'll see when we talk about several herbicides that we use commonly, selectivity usually use some, some sort of physiological thing in the plant to target uh, mechanisms in some plants that are not present in others and that allows the selectivity. That is not to be confused with something like uh, gene editing in crops, for instance, where we actually insert a gene into the plant so that it's resistant to a broad-scale herbicide. That's a, a different kind of thing we'll talk about uh, in this lecture, but uh, these are the general things that you might use herbicides to accomplish. Uh, there's all kinds of crazy names out there where people are marketing these things, uh, like Tap Out, Last Call. These are just a few that I, that I saw on the market recently. Uh, but those are the trade names. The uh, really important thing that uh, we're going to talk about specifically in this class is understanding the active ingredient, uh, which is the, chem the component that's responsible for the control, and the, the mode of action, which is the mechanistic interaction that the herbicide has with plants. All right, so we could have a couple of uh, different kinds of herbicides. They, they might work by con contact, so they'll be called a contact herbicide. Uh, that kills the, the plant where it contacts it, or it could be systemic where the herbicide is absorbed by the plant and, and then it's taken to uh, wherever the, in the plant it takes mode of action. This is one of the things that with the systemic herbicides in particular uh, that we can use to gain selectivity in the herbicide uh, because you could uh, spray it on plants and they mobilize it to a specific part uh, or uh, to a part where a specific mode of action carries out and it doesn't affect some plants like it does others. So we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So to go a little bit further on what I mean by uh, selectivity, we have some herbicides that, you can, that are selective and you can specifically target uh, particular plant species or particular plant groups. That's more common. For instance, uh, we have a couple of herbicides that are grass selective, and uh, that means that they target and kill grasses and they do not affect broadleaf plants. Uh, we might have the opposite for lawn care and uh, turf management in particular, where we might try to kill broadleaf plants and not kill grasses. So those are some examples of selectivity. Uh, and then we have some herbicides like glyphosate or Roundup, uh, they are targeting an amino acid for the mode of action. So the plant mobilizes the chemical to amino acids that are found widely in most all plants. So uh, that herbicide has, uh, is non-selective. It, it broad, broadly kills uh, virtually all plants it contacts. There are a couple of exceptions with that. There are a few ways that you can apply it. So there are herbicides that you apply di directly to soil and uh, there are foliar applied, which are the ones that we've been talking up till now where you're actually spraying it onto plants that are already existing. 
Uh, something that's very important from an environmental standpoint is the amount of residual activity that the uh, herbicide has. And the ones that are really problematic in nature and uh, could, you know, cause the problems that we've seen with herbicides, those generally are the ones that have really high residual activity. Uh, those also tend to be soil applied herbicides. So uh, the contact herbicides, they often neutralize really quick and uh, it, it may be even within a couple of minutes or certainly within a couple of hours, uh, but we would consider those very low residual activity. Okay, so there are a few uh, ways that you can apply herbicides depending on what product it is and and how it works. So the three general timing applications would be pre-plant incorporated. There's something really important about this one. Essentially you're spray, spraying it onto the soil and then incorporating it into the soil by disking it in or turning over the soil so that it's mixed in. The reason you're doing that is because that chemical is volatile. In other words, it, it will turn into a gaseous form uh, really easily. This works by applying it to the soil, incorporating it in so it doesn't volatilize. And then when plants are uh, germinating, they, they uh, are killed when they come into contact with it. It's most of the time non-selective. Uh, that's different than pre-emergence. We apply pre-emergence to the soil as well, but you can think about you have a prepped field uh, that's just bare dirt and then it's already been churned up or planted or whatever, and then you apply the pre-emergence herbicide sort of as a layer across the top and it forms this barrier so that when uh, seed, seeds germinate, as soon as the growing tip hits that barrier, it will kill the, the uh, plant. Those are generally not volatile and we don't have to incorporate them into the soil because of that. And because of that mode of action, it's ideal not to do that because you want this continuous film along the, the uh, soil surface to, to uh, have that barrier. Post-emergence, uh, those are ones that we really commonly use in wildlife management in particular, and we're spraying those directly onto plants or uh, onto plant parts so that they can be absorbed. Uh, those can be contact or systemic, but uh, most are not soil active, and because of that, they tend to have a lower residual activity and uh, don't they, they aren't as problematic environmentally as uh, the ones that have the high soil residual activity. These are plants that are really common in our part of the world that we need to use herbicides for. Uh, you know, I, I deal with a lot of landowners and a lot of people in our profession and obviously a lot of students through the teaching and uh, I'm kind of in the same boat with a lot of the, these people that uh, I don't really like the idea of spreading herbicides or chemicals in the environment all the time. However, uh, let's look at this picture for a second. Uh, how many of you know what plants you're looking at in this community? Well, if you don't know, uh, you might think that this is a pretty good early successional community for wildlife, but if you do know what is in there, you probably realize that a lot of this, this uh, green biomass is actually Sericea lespidiza, and the grasses that are mixed in are Johnson grass. So almost 100% of the biomass in here is non-native plants that do not provide a high wildlife value. And because of that, this field would be pretty much useless for wildlife. All right, so what about, you know, why does that matter from an herbicide standpoint? Well, if you were gonna try to restore this field so that, you know, these early successional wildlife species that you're targeting uh, would benefit from it, you're, you're almost forced into a situation where you use herbicide because there are no other ways that we could practically get, a, get rid of the, this weed problem, all right? 
Uh, in particular, the Bermuda, Fescue, Kogon grass, and Japan grass on this list. Sericea probably falls into that same one, so if you didn't catch those that I just named, go back, rewind, and listen to this again. Those are species that we don't have another option except herbicides to practically get rid of them. And in particular, those species, when they are present, the wildlife value plummets uh, to near nothing in those communities. Particularly the non-native pasture grasses like Bermuda or fescue, uh, we've talked a lot about Bahia, that's really common in pastures here. Because of the suite of adaptations of those species, they, they handle disturbance and herbivory and all these other tools that we've been talking about and ways to use it. There's not really a combination of ways that we can use those tools to get rid of the problem. And without getting rid of the problem, we're, we're not going to benefit wildlife or, or restore uh, the community in a form that, that promotes wildlife habitat. So unfortunately, in those circumstances, if you want to create uh, or restore wildlife habitat, we don't have another option other than using herbicides. So I think that's an important context for us to, to realize and uh, you know, keep in mind, especially given that a large portion of our wildlife of conservation concern are associated with early successional communities. And those communities often include a suite of plant species that we can't do anything without herbicides uh, to restore. There are a few uh, common methods that you might apply herbicide uh, for these, these uh, foliar applicated ones. So those again, those are the ones that we use most commonly. By far, we would use the broadcast method, which you can see up in the top right. Somebody's on a tractor with a boom and you're just broadly applying the herbicide right over the top of all the weeds. Uh, you could do that with a selective herbicide to, to kill some specific parts of the plant community and leave others. But, uh, you know, that's pretty common to use that with broad spectrum herbicides or selective. Uh, you can see the, the bottom left picture, this guy is spot spraying individual plants that are undesirable. And this one, uh, more typically, we would use a broad spectrum herbicide because we are directly applying the, the herbicide to specific plants that are unwanted. Less common uh, in wildlife management, but perhaps more common in agriculture, we might use strip spraying. Uh, if you have a crop species that's in a row, you apply herbicide in the uh, in the rows where you don't affect the the uh, crop plant, but you reduce competition for it. Uh, so generally, uh, we're using one of these three methods when we're applying herbicide. There are a few other ways, and obviously, uh, if you're you, you know you might use that same boom sprayer in the top right to apply the soil uh, you know pre-plant incorporated or the pre-emergent herbicides, but uh, generally, it's one of these three methods, regardless of the herbicide. <clears throat> it's pretty common uh, to use these in forestry practices as well that can be really important. And uh, you're, if you look at that top left picture, you can see uh, this tractor specially designed to apply a foliar application of triclopyr. And basically what, what they're trying to accomplish in this is what you're looking at on the bottom left picture. All right, so that herbicide, well, let's back up. In the picture on, on the bottom, notice that on the right side of the picture, there's a developed mid-story of hardwood species, and look at all that shade underneath those. Wildlife, mo most of our wildlife species, there are only a couple of species that, that actually in the south would do better on the right than they do in the left. And the herbicide in this case can turn a situation where you have all of that biomass in the midstory. It could actually be dangerous to burn in that case because of the high fuel loads, but also fire may not very effectively kill uh, a lot of those trees that have kind of escaped that, the uh, fire at this point. 
the herbicide can be used to very quickly go from right to left. Okay, so it accelerates that process. So we could take a stand that's in really bad shape and turn it into a really good structure in rapid order. So that's the real benefit of using herbicide in this case. Uh, otherwise, we might need repeated fire over even the course of decades, in some cases, to get stands from the right to look like the left. Uh, that's a really common problem that we have because a lot of the southern piney woods look like the stand on the right. Uh, they're just not desirable from a wildlife habitat standpoint. So we're very commonly tasked with this situation where we need to transition from the right of that fo of photograph to the left. And uh, herbicides can do that really rapidly because they kill all the, the hardwood stems in there and then the fire just cleans it up at that point. So uh, on the right side, uh, that's a, a post-emergence herbicide called imazapir. Uh, I'm, I'm listing these two in particular because they are very commonly used in forest management and uh, we use them for wildlife management a lot. Uh, this is an interesting picture. Uh, this was actually a, some uh, multi-use study on different kinds of agriculture. So they were growing trees and what you're looking at in the row is actually switchgrass that they were trying to grow for biofuel. So there are all kinds of of uh, strategies out there that we're trying and, and uh, that, you know, different land management strategies that people are actually implementing in herbicides, depending on what your strategy is and what your goal is, uh, sometimes are, are a, an important part of that management regime. So in general, uh, I'm going to go through several types of herbicides. The ones that we use very commonly I'm going to list on, you know, like under this common one, uh, you know, two, for, for plant growth regulators, that would be 2,4-D or Buterac, Dicamba, Picloram, Triclopyr. Uh, any of those would be really commonly used for, from a wildlife habitat management standpoint. I'm not going to go in detail into how these different things work. I've provided you a lot of information here so that you can read about that. but. Uh, I mainly want you to realize that we have different herbicides that take different modes of action and, uh, you know, we use them strategically based on that to, to facilitate wildlife management objectives. Uh, but it would be a good idea for you to be able to name a few of the common ones that are associated with these, these different uh, types of herbicides or different modes of action like this. Uh, so understand what the mode of action is and then some of the common, uh, be able to name some of the common ones that we use. Uh, amino acid biosynthesis inhibitors are the broad spectrum. So these are actually targeting uh, that amino acids that are only in plants. So not only, I, I think that's an important thing for to point out, like uh, animals don't have the amino acid that is being inhibited uh, in these plants. So these tend, these are ones that we use really commonly and they tend to be less toxic and have less indirect or non-target effects in the environment because they're, they're not hot, they don't have a high residual activity and they also are targeting something that's only in plants. All right, so uh, that being said, that doesn't mean there's no risk associated with them. You've probably seen there's a bunch of stuff uh, in the media about glyphosate and uh, risk to farmers that are using it widely. Uh, but also understand that, you know, the, the people that are uh, part of those, those lawsuits and things that are going on also use herb, those herbicides all the time year round for all these different cropping systems. They're, they're exposed to it a great deal more than generally we would be if we're using it in wildlife management. Unless your job was an applicator where you're doing it day in and day out, uh, obviously uh, there's some concern there then. Uh, clethodum is a grass selective herbicide. Those you, uh, that we use really commonly, those are targeting facet, fatty acids or lipids and uh, they inhibit the production of those. And because of the way that the, 
that an uh, inhibitor works and the fact that it's targeting a fatty acid, it, it specifically kills grasses and doesn't affect, uh, it doesn't affect broadleaf plants. So uh, really useful, especially if you're in a situation where you have some of these non-native uh, pasture grasses that are really problematic, you may be able to spray and kill those specific plants and uh, not affect the desirable forbs that you want to leave behind. <clears throat> uh, here are some, a few of the other types. They're not used quite as commonly, uh, but we do use them sometimes in, in our field. Uh, these also uh, tend to have a higher residual activity. One that you may be familiar with is atrazine. That one's wildly widely used in corn. And uh, you can see, uh, based on this map, it corresponds really well, the use of it with, uh, with the corn belt. But uh, it's also one of the ones that has caused a lot of environmental problems associated with the application of herbicides. <clears throat> Again, uh, it's a good idea for you to be able to name some of these and, and have a general understanding of what a seedling growth inhibitor actually means. So I've provided that information for you here. Another thing that I wanted to do, I didn't want to belabor this point. We're gonna work with herbicides in the field and talk about them and, and see uh, different application styles of this. Uh, in the field, so you'll get some experience with it. But the main thing I wanted to do is provide you with a resource. Uh, to, so I've provided a series of tables here in the last couple of slides uh, that gives you some, some basic information that you need to know if you were gonna use herbicides for different uh, reasons. So again, if you're interested in restoration, particularly in our part of the world, and you know uh, Florida is well known for invasive species. You probably think of invasive wildlife species, but uh, we have a, a lot of, of really problematic plant species as well. And many of those force us into a situation where we need these herbicides to, to uh, restore habitat. So uh, I wanted to provide you information with a bunch of herbicides that we use pretty commonly. Uh, so you can read through these tables and, and kind of get an idea of that and then use it as a resource down the road if you end up in a, in a uh, position that you need to understand the use of these. So uh, here's a, another slide. You can see there are just an unbelievable amount of herbicides. There's all kinds of selectivity out there. Uh, many of these will have several trade names that are associated with the same active ingredient. Uh, so I just wanted to provide you all of these herbicides. Those, that, that, those tables right there are not all inclusive, but they do include a large portion of the ones that we use really commonly in our field. All right, so that was the last of the lectures. I wanted to keep this one uh, relatively short because I know that you're probably tired of listening to me lecture and you're ready for the field components of the course. So thanks for listening and uh, we'll see you in the field.